Chapter 61. High-risk items? They're all just trinkets. Levitation cloak upgrade. Blake carefully turned around and secured the door behind him, ensuring it was shut tight. He wanted to make sure their little intrusion remained undisturbed. Approaching the conspicuous box that had caught his eye, Blake paused, not immediately opening it. He reasoned that after Filch's unfortunate experience of being burgled, the caretaker would undoubtedly have fortified this box with some form of protection. Despite Filch's lack of magical ability, he was no fool. With a thoughtful expression, Blake retrieved his custom wand, which bore the elegant design of Mithril. He tapped the box gently with the wand, then proceeded to cast a series of subtle spells he had learned from Grindelwald, aimed at detecting any traps. His eyes sparkled with anticipation as he murmured a spell under his breath, relax when you've exhausted your strength. A soft click followed, signaling to Blake that the box's internal mechanism had been successfully disarmed by his magic. This spell, a clever piece of detection magic from Grindelwald, was something Blake had learned in his youth, more out of curiosity than necessity. Yet it proved invaluable in circumventing Filch's safeguards. With another wave of his wand, the box's lid swung open on its own. Blake's attention was immediately drawn to a small round mirror affixed to the inside of the lid. It was a common spyglass, readily available in Diagon Alley, designed to alert the owner if the box was tampered with. However, it now lay dormant, stripped of its magic by Blake's intervention. The box itself was deceptively ordinary in appearance, yet it was enchanted with the traceless stretch spell, making its interior far more spacious than its exterior dimensions would suggest. Inside, Blake discovered an eclectic assortment of items. At the center lay a large stack of papers, seemingly important documents. Blake surmised that Fred and George must have rummaged through this box earlier, likely in search of the Marauder's Map. Surrounding the documents were various oddities, a wand radiating a malevolent energy, an antique teapot with a sinister appearance, a hefty machete, several peculiar spinning tops, and numerous jars filled with strange liquids alongside items resembling explosives. Beneath this layer of oddments, more items were hidden, requiring further investigation. However, Blake was cautious not to handle these items directly. The warning on the box's exterior, highly dangerous, was not to be taken lightly. These were items confiscated from past Hogwarts students, potentially imbued with harmful curses or enchantments. Using his wand, Blake carefully sifted through the documents, uncovering bizarre research papers on topics such as eliminating reproductive barriers between humans and centaurs, alongside an unidentified potion formula and a mysterious spellbook that he dared not open for fear of being cursed. Blake's expectations for finding anything of value were low. The box seemed to contain nothing more than cursed magical trinkets and peculiar research papers, offering little of interest. Yet, as he continued his search among the cursed objects, hoping against hope to uncover something worthwhile, his time was running short. Madame Loris had only afforded him an hour, and he could not afford to waste it rummaging through this collection of oddities. Just as Blake was about to concede defeat, his gaze fell upon the levitation cloak. The cloak, now invisible, tapped Blake again before stretching out a small hand to point at the items in the box. Hmm? What's this? You want these things? Blake asked, intrigued. With a wave of his hand, a wand emanating a sinister aura levitated towards him. A corner of the cloak, floating behind Blake, transformed into a gaping mouth and devoured the wand with a loud crack. Ding! Magical animal materials consumed in appropriate amounts. Ding! The floating cloak's level has slightly increased. Blake's eyes sparkled with excitement. Although the, the items were cursed prank objects, essentially harmful and useless, they contained magical animal materials used in their creation to sustain their magical effects. These materials were not entirely worthless, as Blake's floating cloak could consume them to level up. What? Useless trash? No, they're just treasures in disguise. Blake exclaimed with a smile, his search through the box intensifying. He tossed every useless item into the cloak's transformed mouth, which accepted everything without hesitation. Some items, lacking magical animal materials, did not trigger a level-up notification, but that didn't deter Blake. Eventually, Blake discovered a nearly decayed time-turner. Its outer structure was ruined, 
leaving only the small hourglass intact. Discarding the useless parts into the cloak's mouth, Blake continued his search, feeding the cloak and listening to the continuous system prompts. Though he didn't find anything of significant use, the discarded items served as excellent dog food for the cloak, earning it a substantial amount of experience points and bringing it closer to becoming a legendary artifact. Blake felt no guilt in destroying these harmful objects. As he emptied the box, the cloak let out a long burp. Ding! The floating cloak has been upgraded to the primary level. Ding! The floating cloak's attributes have increased by 20%. Blake observed the cloak, noticing a new red trim along its edge and feeling a significant boost in its magical power. In a short time, he had fed almost everything in the box to the cloak, including magic books and miscellaneous papers, except for a piece of parchment that appeared to be a map, which might prove useful. As Filch's footsteps approached, Blake quickly replaced the box lid, restored its mechanism with a tap of his wand, and exited Filch's office, locking the door behind him. He leaned against the wall, making room for Filch to pass without noticing him, despite being only half a meter away. Damn it! You guys ran fast this time! Next time, I must catch you troublemakers! Filch grumbled as he walked past, reminiscing about the past when he could lock up and hang troublemakers on the wall. Unseen, Blake couldn't help but feel a sense of accomplishment for his clever evasion and the successful upgrade of his floating cloak. Completely invisible, Blake was undetected as Madame Loris shouted in his direction before she and Filch retreated into the office. Filch, trusting his cat implicitly, simply assumed the culprits had escaped too swiftly. Blake allowed himself a small smile, then turned to leave, content with his haul. Though he hadn't found anything of substantial value this time, the opportunity to upgrade his cloak and save on magical animal materials was a significant gain. Moreover, the hourglass and the map he acquired promised to be of value. Blake made his way directly to the Hufflepuff common room. As he approached the door, his cloak reverted from its invisible state back to the appearance of a school uniform. It was around 11 o'clock, not particularly late, but the common room was usually empty at this hour. Tonight, however, it was bustling with students engrossed in their studies. Feeling somewhat guilty for his late return, Blake headed to his dormitory. Just outside the door, he could hear a commotion inside. Voices shouted in panic and frustration, followed by a series of bangs and exclamations of dismay. It seemed his absence had allowed Sniff, his mischievous pet, to indulge in its natural instincts. Upon entering, Blake found Dabao, his pet, attempting to remove a shiny button from Roger's trousers, while Wayne hurriedly stashed away anything that gleamed. The room fell silent as Blake stepped in, but the pause was brief. Sniff discarded the button and leapt into Blake's arms while his roommates rushed to him with complaints. Brother, they exclaimed in unison, their appearances disheveled. Sniff isn't human. It's been bullying us, taking all our pocket money, and now it wants the button on my underwear. Blake raised an E, Yebrow. Why are there buttons on your underwear? He asked, amused, yet focusing on the more pressing issue. The roommate's grievances painted a picture of Dabao's reign of terror. Blake, however, knew such behavior was meant for outsiders, not friends. He placed Dabao on the table, and the creature's demeanor shifted from defiant to anxious under Blake's stern gaze. Despite its initial bravado, Dabao seemed to be pleading its innocence. Blake was not swayed. I appreciate your help in acquiring treasures, he began, but bullying others without my consent is unacceptable. I'm very disappointed, and you should know I'm quite upset. Dabao's protests turned into a flurry of squeaks, but Blake's response was to gently but firmly hold Dabao upside down, tickling its belly until a cascade of shiny objects, clearly pilfered from Wayne and Roger, clattered onto the table. With its hoard now gone, Dabao's spirit seemed to deflate. Squeak, squeak, it protested weakly, but Blake was already apologizing to his roommates. With a flick of his wand, he repaired the damaged items, including the buttons and a broken mirror, restoring peace to the dormitory. Wayne and Roger stared in amazement at the items in their hands, now restored to pristine condition, as if by magic. You, you're incredibly skilled, Wayne exclaimed, his voice tinged with awe. When did you master this spell? Roger asked, his tone a mixture of curiosity and envy. Next to you, 
my wand might as well just be a stick for lighting fires. Initially, both of them harbored some grievances. After all, their seemingly unreliable roommate had decided to adopt Sniff, a decision that had brought them nothing but trouble that evening. However, witnessing Blake's adept handling of magic changed their perspective entirely. They found themselves eager to learn from him. Blake, feeling somewhat guilty, decided to share his knowledge of the restoration spell with them. You would have learned this spell eventually, he explained, so I see no harm in teaching you a bit earlier. It's like what Hermione did, studying ahead to ensure she was well prepared. With this new skill at their disposal, Wayne and Roger dedicated themselves to mastering the restoration spell, eager to wield it with the same flexibility they had seen in Blake. Meanwhile, Blake took Dabao aside for a stern talking to. After making his disappointment clear, he laid down a new rule with a firm tone. From now on, you're coming with me wherever I go. You can't just go around causing trouble for our dorm mates, and besides. At this, Sniff tilted his head, his small eyes filled with confusion and a hint of curiosity about what was to come. Chapter 62, System Upgrade. The Birth of Almighty Blake. Introducing the new skill, the Horse of Love Kills Chickens. The night enveloped the dormitory in darkness. Wayne and Roger had already succumbed to sleep, leaving Blake alone with his thoughts and the day's spoils. He began to tally his treasures. Ten golden treasure chests, twenty-one silver ones, and a staggering seventy-five bronze chests. It was, without a doubt, a bountiful haul. However, a tinge of regret lingered in Blake's mind. During the morning's transfiguration class, despite the risks he took, Professor McGonagall hadn't rewarded him with the coveted diamond treasure chest. Had she done so, he could have synthesized two diamond chests with his current collection. Nevertheless, synthesizing a single diamond chest still felt like a victory. As Blake prepared to merge his treasure chests, a thought halted his actions. He realized he hadn't opened any bronze chests in succession before. Given their quantity, he reasoned that there must be something of value among them, despite their lower quality compared to the silver and gold chests. Curiosity piqued, Blake decided to explore the potential rewards beyond the usual money and skill mastery. System, open a bronze treasure chest for me, Blake commanded. Ding, the system is opening a bronze treasure chest, the system responded. Ding, congratulations to the host for obtaining intermediate electrical mastery. Blake was taken aback. Electrical mastery? He suddenly felt an understanding of electrical circuits flood his mind. He recalled the first bronze chest he had opened, which had granted him intermediate cooking mastery, now overshadowed by his superb cooking mastery. This revelation led Blake to question the logic behind the treasure chest's rewards. Why did silver chests yield beginner-level skills while bronze chests offered intermediate ones? System, open another bronze treasure chest, Blake requested, eager for more discoveries. Ding, opening a bronze treasure chest for the host. Ding, congratulations to the host for obtaining intermediate piano mastery. Lying on his bed, Blake stroked his chin thoughtfully. It dawned on him that the skills from bronze chests were non-magical, related to the muggle world, whereas silver chests provided basic magical skills like herbology and potion making. Curious about what other surprises the bronze chests held, Blake asked the system to open ten more consecutively. Ding! Currently opening ten bronze treasure chests. The system announced a series of rewards. Intermediate guitar mastery, intermediate fishing proficiency, a pair of bear slippers, a platinum ring, a bottle of cola, and Eighth Brother's secret hamburger recipe. Blake was baffled. While he appreciated the intermediate skills, the assortment of items like slippers, a ring, cola, and a hamburger was bewildering. It became clear that bronze chests could contain anything from valuable jewelry to seemingly mundane objects. The disparity in value was vast. Yet, Blake saw the silver lining. Acquiring a variety of ordinary skills meant he would have a basic understanding of many areas, enriching his skill set with intermediate mastery in several fields. As Blake pondered the eclectic mix of rewards, he couldn't help but feel excited about the possibilities these new skills and items presented. The night's exploration of bronze treasure chests had revealed a world of potential, making him all the more determined to become truly almighty. Blake was elated. 
After realizing he could leverage his newly acquired skills to unearth more treasure chests, much like he had with his cooking proficiency, he saw it as a way to boost his resources. Without a second thought, he eagerly opened all the remaining bronze treasure chests. To his delight, the chests frequently dropped skill mastery items, transforming him into a jack-of-all-trades with knowledge spanning various fields. His mastery levels in these skills surpassed even those of experts in some areas. However, Blake's ambition didn't stow P there. He examined a platinum ring he had found, convinced that nothing from the treasure chests was without value. Upon closer inspection, he discovered a faint inscription, low-level agility ring, increases reaction by 0.1% upon wearing. This revelation was a game-changer for Blake. It dawned on him that the system could indeed dispense equipment, a realization reinforced by recalling the blue floating cloak and a pair of bear slippers he had previously overlooked, each with their own modest enhancements to his abilities. Blake's attention then shifted to the consumable items he had acquired, such as a bottle of Coke and a secret hamburger from Eighth Brother, both of which had special effects like replenishing magic power and quickly restoring physical strength, respectively. These consumables seemed more immediately useful than the equipment, given the latter's minimal attribute bonuses. Contemplating the surplus of equipment, Blake wished for a way to break them down into something more useful. With a bit of intuition about how the system worked, he voiced his desire for an equipment breakdown feature, which the system promptly provided. After breaking down most of the equipment, he was left with a variety of materials, including metals and magical animal components. Blake pondered the possibility of an equipment manufacturing system, which the system confirmed existed but required blueprints he didn't possess. Despite this, the system upgrade unlocked synthesis and decomposition functions and promised materials and normal equipment as rewards. Feeling a mix of frustration and anticipation, Blake turned his attention to the silver treasure chests, hoping they would yield even greater treasures. His optimism was rewarded with announcements of new acquisitions, elementary black magic proficiency, 100 potion concoction experience points, and a strand of unicorn hair. These discoveries not only expanded Blake's repertoire of skills and resources, but also deepened his understanding of the system's potential to enhance his capabilities. With each new treasure chest opened, Blake's journey became increasingly intertwined with the mysteries and opportunities presented by the magical system at his disposal. After opening the silver treasure chest, Blake discovered that the rewards were significantly superior to those from the bronze treasure chest. The silver chest yielded not only valuable materials, but also some equipment with impressive attributes. Without hesitation, Blake discarded the inferior bronze-ranked equipment, opting to equip the superior items from the silver chest, including a watch, a necklace, a ring, a pair of gloves, and a pair of glasses. These new additions noticeably enhanced his overall attributes. Feeling a surge of excitement, Blake quietly got out of bed, careful not to wake his sleeping roommates. He slipped on the pair of leather shoes he had just acquired. To his amazement, they not only fit perfectly, but also made him feel significantly lighter. Walking around the room, he couldn't help but admire the boost in his combat abilities these items provided. The equipment with less desirable attributes could be broken down into materials, which could then be used to upgrade his hovering cloak or craft even better equipment in the future. After experimenting with his new gear, Blake lay back down, his mind already on the next set of treasures. He had silver treasure chests left to open, but his thoughts were consumed by the allure of the gold and diamond treasure chests. The possibility of obtaining items as powerful as the hovering cloak or something akin to a druid's magic board from a diamond chest was too tempting to resist. With a mix of anticipation and impatience, Blake decided to merge the gold treasure chests and go straight for a diamond treasure chest. The system responded to his command, and soon, he was staring at the notification of his reward, the magical version of the Love Horse Chicken Kill. Blake was momentarily taken aback. The Love Horse Chicken Kill, a skill known for its peculiar effect, was now his. According to the system, 
This skill allowed the user to hit an enemy with a force that would massage their nerves and vibrate their glands at a specific frequency, rendering them incapacitated with pleasure and unable to move. Despite the skill's odd nature, Blake couldn't deny its potential effectiveness. He imagined a scenario where a group of Death Eaters was completely overwhelmed by the skill, unable to fight back due to the overwhelming sensation. The thought made him shudder with a mix of disbelief and intrigue. Although the Love Horse Chicken Kill seemed bizarre, Blake recognized its strategic value. In a world filled with danger and unexpected challenges, having such a unique skill could very well turn the tides in his favor. Blake's excitement was palpable as he pondered the potential of his newfound ability. The spell he had mastered was formidable. A single hit would render his opponent immobile, regardless of the spell used. This power was not just strong, it was game-changing. And as the corners of Blake's mouth turned upwards in a sly grin, he entertained a thought that made his heart race even faster. Who had decreed that this skill could only be directed at foes? A soft chuckle escaped him. Ha-ha! The sound was light, almost mischievous, as if he were sharing a secret with the night itself. Blake, ever the optimist, was blissfully unaware of the stir his laughter caused among his companions. Meanwhile, Wayne, feigning sleep with his head buried under his covers, couldn't help but think the worst. It's over. The boss must be under some ghost spell, he muttered to himself, a hint of worry lacing his words. He imagined Blake rising any moment now, wandering about with that unsettling laughter. He's going to start pacing soon, he whispered to no one in particular, and then that eerie laughter will follow. The room was filled with a sense of unease, the others sharing worried glances. Blake's odd behavior had clearly unsettled them, their minds racing with thoughts of supernatural possession and the creepy laughter that seemed to echo in the darkness. Chapter 63. Blake inspires a change in Hufflepuff. Good morning, Professor Sprout, greeted the young wizards cheerfully as they encountered their house dean on the way to the Hufflepuff common room. Professor Sprout, always enthusiastic, returned their greetings with a warm smile. This morning ritual was familiar to her, as she made her way to the common room daily to tend to the unique plants that thrived there. These plants, known for their calming effects, required her special attention to maintain their stress-relieving aura for the students. However, this morning felt different. As more students greeted her than usual, Professor Sprout sensed something unusual. Typically, at this early hour, the Hufflepuff common room would be nearly empty, with most students preferring to stay in bed until the last possible moment before their classes at nine o'clock. Curiosity piqued, she hastened her steps to the common room, wondering if perhaps there was a special occasion she had forgotten about. Upon entering the familiar space, Professor Sprout was taken aback. Instead of the usual quiet, with only a few house elves tidying up, the room was bustling with activity. Students were not just lounging around, but were actively engaged in discussions about their homework. It was a sight she had never seen before at this hour, leading her to momentarily question if she had somehow entered the wrong common room or if she was dreaming. Morning, Professor Sprout, the students called out, noticing her arrival. Their enthusiastic greeting and the sight of them diligently working together filled her with a mix of astonishment and confusion. Children, have you done something wrong, she asked, half-jokingly, trying to make sense of the unusual scene. Tell me what it is, and I'll help you sort it out. A Hufflepuff student stepped forward, his words touching Professor Sprout deeply. This is our dean, our Professor Sprout. Instead of thinking about punishment or point deductions, her first thought is to help us resolve our issues. Professor, you've always been so kind to us, and we've taken that for granted. The room filled with voices of agreement, expressing their newfound appreciation for Professor Sprout's dedication. We've been too selfish, not recognizing all that you've done for us. We've been content with being labeled as the less ambitious house, but no more. We can't bear to see you ridiculed alongside us. We're determined to win this year's school championship and the Quidditch Cup. The determination in their voices was palpable. The Hufflepuff Quidditch team, having faced defeats and near losses in the past, was now motivated to strive for victory. 
without relying on new recruits or external reinforcements. Professor Sprout, moved to tears by their words, realized the profound impact of their resolve. The transformation in her students, sparked by a newfound sense of pride and ambition, was a sight she had never imagined witnessing. In that moment, she knew that this was no dream. The Hufflepuff house was united, ready to challenge the stereotypes and prove their worth, not just to Hogwarts, but to themselves. The hope of winning the championship was dwindling. If we continue like this, if we don't put in more effort, we're going to lose to Slytherin soon. And after we lose, Slytherin will just hand the victory to Gryffindor. When we face Ravenclaw, you all should be ashamed. The captain rebuked the team members for their lack of progress. Cedric's eyes blazed with determination. He shouted, Captain, lead us forward once more. In the Hufflepuff common room, the atmosphere transformed into one of vibrant energy. Professor Sprout, observing the sudden change, was bewildered. She couldn't grasp how the mood had shifted so drastically overnight. Why had these students suddenly become so driven, and why did they seem so appreciative of her? While it was positive to see them motivated, she needed to understand the catalyst for this change. What? What happened? She asked, puzzled. Why this Sue, den desire to work hard? Cedric, clutching his broom, approached her. Professor, it was Blake's words that inspired us, he explained, sharing the motivational speech Blake had given the night before. Professor Sprout was moved to tears. Throughout her tenure, Hufflepuff had been unfairly labeled as the house for the less academically inclined. Even after becoming the head of the house, she faced criticism. Accustomed to it as she might have been, the constant prejudice was disheartening. Hearing Cedric's recount of Blake's words, particularly the appreciation for her efforts, overwhelmed her. Children, you are all wonderful, she managed to say, her voice choked with emotion. All right, since we're all in agreement, she declared, her spirit reignited. Let's show everyone what Hufflepuff is truly about. We'll prove that Hufflepuff is not a house for fools. A round of enthusiastic applause filled the common room. Meanwhile, in Blake's dormitory, the initiator of this newfound motivation, Blake awoke to a peculiar smell. He noticed a pile of treasure chests that had appeared in his system space, prompting deep contemplation. At breakfast in the Great Hall, Professor Sprout's red eyes caught the attention of Professor McGonagall. Pomona, what's the matter? McGonagall inquired, concerned. Nothing, Minerva. I'm just deeply moved, Sprout replied. Moved by what? The students, they've suddenly become so thoughtful, Sprout explained. Dumbledore, who rarely joined for breakfast, noticed the exchange. Seeing Sprout's emotional state, he worried that Blake, known for his mischief, might have caused trouble. As a mentor, he felt responsible for guiding Blake back on track if needed. Is it Blake's doing? Dumbledore asked cautiously. Professor Sprout, reflecting on her years of silent dedication to Hufflepuff, felt validated by Blake's understanding and support. Yes, she confirmed. It's that child. Dumbledore, misunderstanding the situation, prepared to intervene. However, upon seeing Blake enter the Great Hall with two friends, he called out sternly, Blake! The students turned their attention to the faculty table, curious about the commotion. Blake, unlike the other students, walked confidently, unaware of the misunderstanding about to unfold. As Blake rose from his bed, he donned the gear he had acquired the previous night, immediately feeling a surge in his strength. With a spring in his step, he made his way toward the dining hall, ready to start his day with a hearty breakfast. However, his journey was interrupted by a call. Lifting his gaze, he saw Professor Dumbledore approaching with a grave expression. Blake's heart raced, his mind racing through the events of the previous day, wondering which of his actions had caught the headmaster's attention. Upon reaching the faculty table, Dumbledore observed Blake's guilty and perplexed demeanor and sighed, mistakenly believing he had pinpointed the issue. Blake, do you realize what you've done? He began, only to be interrupted by Professor Sprout's unexpected gratitude. Oh, Blake, thank you. I never imagined someone I've barely met would understand me so well, she exclaimed, revealing that Cedric had shared Blake's actions with her actions that had significantly uplifted the spirits of everyone in Hufflepuff House. Dumbledore, taken aback by this revelation, realized his misjudgment. It appeared Blake had inadvertently done something commendable, 
enough to move Professor Sprout to tears. Meanwhile, Blake was still piecing together the situation, realizing his casual words had sparked a positive chain reaction within Hufflepuff House. As Dumbledore hastily excused himself, citing other matters to attend to, Professor Sprout turned to Blake, explaining how his actions had inspired the Hufflepuff students to work harder. She proposed awarding him extra points, a suggestion to which Professor McGonagall, after quickly understanding the situation, agreed without hesitation. Blake, you've earned Hufflepuff 50 points, Professor Sprout, T announced with a warm smile. Professor McGonagall couldn't help but wish Gryffindor had a student who could similarly motivate their house, especially after the recent deduction of points from the Weasley twins. Yet, she recognized the fairness in rewarding Blake for his positive influence on Hufflepuff. As a result, Hufflepuff House surged to first place in the House Points competition, much to the excitement of its members. Blake's return to the Hufflepuff table was met with enthusiastic greetings, his peers clearly appreciative of his contribution to their newfound lead. The day's first class was Defense Against the Dark Arts, taught by Professor Quirrell, who was secretly harboring Voldemort. While the rest of the students buzzed with excitement, Blake remained composed, aware of the dark secret lurking behind Quirrell's stuttering facade. Blake was well aware of his own teaching capabilities, or rather, the lack thereof. The prospect of teaching did not excite him in the slightest. However, the situation with Quirrell presented an intriguing challenge. If Quirrell, or more accurately, the Voldemort that would later possess him, intended to conceal himself within Hogwarts so effortlessly, Blake couldn't help but wonder how such a feat could be achieved without his notice. After all, he considered himself the de facto authority within the school's walls. Despite Voldemort's significantly weakened state, Blake couldn't shake off the thought that the rewards for dealing with such a formidable foe would be substantial. The metaphorical treasure chest that Voldemort represented, in Blake's eyes, was bound to contain valuable spoils. After pondering the situation for a moment, an idea sparked in Blake's mind. He resolved to have a thorough discussion with Quirrell. To be more precise, his intention was to confront the malevolent spirit of Voldemort that would eventually take hold of Quirrell. This was not just a meeting, it was an opportunity to gauge the threat level and possibly gain an upper hand in the unfolding events at Hogwarts. Chapter 64 Grindelwald's Rebuke Dumbledore's Oversight Dumbledore sat behind his desk, his expression awkward as he reflected on his recent misunderstanding with Tom. The incident had left him stressed, causing him to view situations negatively and jump to conclusions. In this case, he had wrongfully suspected Blake of misconduct. To his surprise, Blake had not only refrained from any wrongdoing, but had also inspired his peers with positivity and motivation. Dumbledore couldn't help but feel remorseful for doubting such a kind and intelligent child. I'm really getting worse, he sighed, regretting not apologizing to Blake immediately. He pondered how he could make amends, knowing well the sting of being unjustly accused. As Dumbledore was about to seek out Blake to offer a sincere apology, an owl flew in through the window, delivering a red letter before departing. Dumbledore's brow furrowed at the sight of the howler. It had been ages since he last received one. Curious and cautious, he cast a spell to contain the letter's imminent outburst within a magical bubble, allowing it to open without causing a disturbance. The letter transformed, its envelope mimicking a mouth, and began its tirade at a moderated volume, thanks to Dumbledore's spell. However, the content of the message quickly drained the color from Dumbledore's face. It was from Grindelwald, berating him for his misjudgment of Blake's actions, and accusing him of neglect. Grindelwald pointed out that even the basic care Blake received came from his own house elves, highlighting Dumbledore's failure to provide adequate support. The letter criticized Dumbledore for not personally seeing Blake off to Hogwarts, suggesting that a wizard of his caliber could easily manage such a task without significant time loss. Dumbledore listened to the Howler's complaints, which lasted over ten minutes, but it wasn't the scolding that troubled him the most. It was the realization that Grindelwald, confined in Nurmengard, had taken the time to send this message. Dumbledore had been aware of Grindelwald's interest in Blake, 
but the direct communication from his old adversary underscored a significant oversight on his part. The Howler's words echoed in Dumbledore's mind, particularly the mention of Blake's envy seeing other children accompanied by their parents. It highlighted a gap in the care and attention Dumbledore had provided, prompting him to reconsider his approach to guardianship and mentorship. Grindelwald's intervention, despite his imprisonment, served as a stark reminder of Dumbledore's responsibilities, not just as a headmaster, but as a guardian to those under his care. The message from Grindelwald, though harsh, was a wake-up call for Dumbledore to reassess his priorities and ensure that he offered the support and guidance his students, especially Blake, truly needed. The letter was within Dumbledore's tolerance. The number 182. What had just transpired on his side? How had he found out so quickly? He even sent a roaring letter that lasted for more than ten minutes. This meant that it had just happened. Even Dumbledore hadn't returned to his office yet, when he had already started recording the roaring letter. This proved one point. Grindelwald had been secretly watching this child all along. Why was he so concerned about this child? Although this child was indeed of his bloodline, Dumbledore didn't believe that, given his personality, he would exert so much effort for a child he had never met. Or could it be that Grindelwald still hadn't given up? Could it be that he harbored the evil intention of turning this child into a weapon in his hands? The more Dumbledore pondered, the more he felt that something was amiss. Grindelwald was very skilled at manipulation. What if Blake, the child, was unwittingly led astray by him? The more Dumbledore thought about it, the more grave his concerns became. He suddenly stood up. Baker! Come out! The headmaster's office fell silent, save for the portraits of past headmasters on the wall which looked at Dumbledore in surprise. Dumbledore took a deep breath, trying to speak as calmly as possible. Baker, I know you're at Hogwarts. Come out. I have a message for you to pass on to your old master. With a pop, the house elf Baker appeared in front of Dumbledore, looking timid. He recognized Blake as his master, and since Dumbledore shared the same bloodline as Blake, he could be considered his master too. Being at Hogwarts, Baker couldn't refuse Dumbledore's summons. Dumbledore, now aware of how Grindelwald received news so quickly, addressed the elf. Help me relay these words to Grindelwald, word for word. Stay out of Blake's matters. I can tolerate you keeping an eye on the child's growth through the house elf. I can even tolerate you writing to me and offering advice. Because I admit that you were right in your shouting letter. I did make a mistake. But I absolutely cannot tolerate you directly interfering with the child's education. Between you and him, communication can only occur through me. You cannot contact the child directly. Dumbledore stood tall. Baker, do you understand? Yes, Baker nodded. Then go, and don't miss a word. Yes, yes. Meanwhile, at Nurmengard, Grindelwald angrily threw the notebook in his hand. Bastard! Dumbledore, you think you can take care of the child? You can't. You don't have the capability, and you know it. At this moment, Blake was oblivious to the fact that because of him, Dumbledore and Grindelwald had started quarreling again. He was walking towards the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom, holding a textbook and accompanied by two roommates. Dabao, a small creature, quietly poked its head out of his pocket, which was enchanted with a traceless stretch spell to comfortably fit a sniff. Upon arriving at the classroom, Blake noticed that many students were already seated. Hermione was sitting in the third row, deeply engrossed in the Defense Against the Dark Arts textbook. Wayne and Roger also noticed Hermione. Boss, Roger said suddenly, this time, do you want to continue comforting that girl? Nonsense, the boss will definitely go. Didn't you see that there's still no one sitting beside her? This proves that our consolation didn't work. She still hasn't made any friends. Our boss is a champion of justice. Of course, he won't sit by and do nothing. Boss, come on, we support you. After Wayne finished his enthusiastic speech, he pulled Roger and ran off. What the? Blake muttered, feeling a mix of frustration and amusement. This ridiculous plan was his own creation from the night before, so he could only blame himself. However, for Blake, who was as thick-skinned as they come, sitting directly next to Hermione was no big deal. Good morning, Hermione. Have you had breakfast? I didn't see you in the Great Hall this morning. 
Blake greeted Hermione with a curious tone. Hermione looked up, her expression slightly annoyed. What time did you wake up? She asked. Uh, around 8.30. You didn't wake up early to prepare for class, did you? Blake inquired, somewhat sheepishly. Of course I did. I need to be prepared. Otherwise, how will I follow along with what the professor is discussing? Hermione responded, her dedication to her studies evident. I don't think you need to worry too much about that. Professor Quirrell will probably just go over the textbook again in class, Blake said, trying to reassure her. Professor Quirrell's approach to teaching defense against the dark arts was notoriously simplistic. He often avoided practical demonstrations, preferring instead to stutter through readings from the textbook, occasionally digressing into fabricated tales of his encounters with vampires. His primary goal seemed to be to dispel any suspicions about himself, managing to get through classes with minimal effort. Remarkably, he sometimes didn't even bring his wand to class. How would you know? You haven't attended Professor Quirrell's class, Hermione pointed out, skeptical of Blake's assertion. I heard about it from someone who did, Blake's plained. Their conversation was interrupted when Hermione noticed a small creature peeking out from Blake's pocket. What's this? she asked, her curiosity piqued. Oh, this is my pet, Dabao, Blake replied, gently taking the creature out of his pocket. It's so adorable. May I pet it? Hermione asked, clearly enchanted by Dabao's cute appearance. Of course, Blake agreed, as Dabao made a series of squeaks that seemed to express its indignation at being treated like a common pet. Blake then performed a peculiar gesture, which he humorously referred to as love horse killing chicken, causing Dabao to relax completely, its eyes rolling back in pleasure. Hermione, unaware of the exchange between Blake and Dabao, gently stroked the creature, marveling at how soft and comfortable it felt. Dabao, now basking in the attention, allowed Hermione and subsequently other girls in the classroom to pet it without resistance. Despite its initial reluctance, Dabao seemed to thrive on the attention, especially after Blake discreetly rewarded it with a gold coin. The promise of compensation seemed to invigorate Dabao, who began to act even more adorably, much to the delight of the students. As the classroom buzzed with excitement over Dabao, Professor Quirrell entered, his timid demeanor barely containing the chaos. He requested Blake to put away his pet, which Blake did, placing Dabao in a drawer, where it continued to receive covert attention from Hermione and Hannah. With Dabao settled, Professor Quirrell attempted to start the class, his stuttering pace suggesting that roll call alone might take a significant portion of the lesson. Blake offered the professor a silent thumbs up, appreciating the unintentional genius of Quirrell's teaching method that allowed for a slow, albeit unconventional, start to the class. After a challenging roll call, Professor Quirrell finally commenced his lecture. Initially, Hermione was the epitome of attentiveness, quill in hand, poised to jot down notes and eager to answer any questions. However, her enthusiasm quickly waned. Just as Blake had predicted, Quirrell began to stutter through the textbook material. Disheartened, Hermione set her quill aside, opting instead to distract herself with Debao rather than endure the monotonous reading. The lecture, devoid of any insightful content, and compounded by Quirrell's overpowering garlic scent, left the classroom in a collective state of lethargy. Eventually, Quirrell concluded the day's reading, with a significant portion of the class time still remaining. Blake fought the urge to applaud, marveling at Quirrell's peculiar sense of time management. Next, in order to illustrate the perils associated with dark creatures, Quirrell began, his pace suggesting the story might not reach its conclusion within the class period, let me share a personal experience. During my travels in Africa, a prince was plagued by zombies. Blake saw an opportunity and seized it, raising her hand with feigned admiration. Quirrell, taken aback, acknowledged her. This, this student, do you have a question? Professor Quirrell, it's incredible that you could defeat zombies, Blake exclaimed. Could you share how you managed to overcome them? By interjecting with her question, Blake not only steered the lecture towards a potentially more engaging topic, but also subtly challenged Quirrell to provide a first-hand account of his claimed expertise, thereby testing the authenticity of his adventurous tales. Chapter 65. Quirrell's Uncomfortable Encounter Quirrell was taken aback. 
he hadn't expected to be directly confronted with such a critical question. In his mind, he had assumed the class would end before any student could delve into the specifics of defeating zombies. He had planned to avoid the topic entirely. But here he was, caught off guard by a student's straightforward inquiry. Quirrell, usually cautious, found himself unprepared and stumbled over his words, trying to concoct an answer on the spot. However, under pressure, he could only offer a vague response. Well, in truth, strong sunlight is the most effective weapon against zombies, Quirrell said, attempting to divert the conversation to the weather, hoping to evade further questioning. However, Blake seemed unfazed by Quirrell's attempt to change the subject and continued to regard him with apparent admiration. I've heard that you had excellent grades when you were a student and were quickly rehired as a professor of defense against the dark arts after graduation. You're truly a role model for me. Quirrell was flustered by Blake's praise, unsure how to respond. Oh, well, you're too kind. You're exaggerating, he managed to say, visibly uncomfortable. Hermione watched the exchange with suspicion, unable to understand Blake's motives. It was common knowledge that Quirrell's teaching abilities were subpar, and yet Blake showered him with compliments. Ignoring Hermione's skeptical gaze, Blake continued, Your achievements are truly remarkable, Professor. Many have aspired to the position of Defense Against the Dark Arts Professor right after graduation, but all were rejected for lacking the necessary talent. Only you were rehired immediately. Doesn't that speak volumes about your excellence? You're certainly more accomplished than those who previously sought the position. Quirrell nearly collapsed in fear at Blake's words. The implications were terrifying. Was Blake insinuating that Quirrell was superior to Voldemort, who had also applied for the position after graduation, but was rejected due to his youth and Dumbledore's advice? Quirrell felt a surge of panic aware that Voldemort, who was secretly attached to him, would be enraged by such a comparison. No, no, no. I was originally a Muggle Studies professor. I've only recently started teaching Defense Against the Dark Arts. I certainly wasn't hired for this role right after graduation, Quirrell hurriedly corrected, his usual stutter miraculously absent in his desperation to clarify. Quirrell's clarification seemed to appease the dark presence lurking within him, at least temporarily, he knew he would face Voldemort's wrath later, but for now, he had narrowly avoided immediate danger. Blake, noticing Quirrell's fear, couldn't help but smile as he collected the rewards generated by Quirrell's emotions. He then pressed on. But, Professor Quirrell, didn't you apply for a teaching position immediately after you graduated? Although you, starting as a Muggle Studies professor was the initial plan. But, the application was successful and Headmaster Dumbledore asked you to switch your teaching position from Muggle Studies to Defense Against the Dark Arts. Doesn't this mean that your talents have been recognized by Professor Dumbledore? This is far better than those who were outright rejected upon applying, right? As soon as Blake finished speaking, Quirrell could only clutch the back of his head, feeling a surge of anger he had momentarily suppressed flare up again. Ouch! What are you doing? Ouch! Quirrell was on the brink of madness. He had exerted so much effort to calm Voldemort's fury, and with just a few words this boy had rekindled that anger. Why provoke him? You could have simply left after class, and who will suffer the consequences? It will still be me, suppressed by his wrath. You insufferable fool. Quirrell loathed Blake deeply. Despite wanting to slap him and sew his mouth shut upon seeing Blake's look of admiration, he was forced to smile and respond to Blake's question. Am I? After all, he was ostensibly being praised. Thank, thank you for your compliment, Quirrell managed to say, though he felt on the verge of tears. The entity at the back of his head was seething with rage, making Quirrell feel as if his head was on fire. Ding! Extreme anger detected. Ding! Congratulations to the host for obtaining a diamond treasure chest. Blake was thrilled. As expected of Voldemort, such a high drop rate, a gold treasure chest and now a diamond treasure chest, and the silver treasure chests dropped by Quirrell are just bonuses. No, you can afford it, Blake insisted. No, I can't afford it. Quirrell glanced at the time, feeling helpless. Because it's a long class, there are still 40 minutes left. How, how am I going to get through these 40 minutes? Quirrell was on the edge of despair. Classmate, that's enough. 
Let's return to the previous topic. Quirrell had no choice but to steer the conversation back, showing a rare firmness. Blake smiled slightly and did not continue to provoke him. A gold treasure chest and a diamond treasure chest. It's time to stop while I'm ahead. There will be plenty of opportunities in the future, right? Seeing Blake finally quiet down, Quirrell sighed in relief. Finally, it's over. Though I'll likely be punished by my master after class, at least I won't have to endure this torment any longer. The fluctuating emotions of Voldemort at the back of his head were giving him a splitting headache. Just as Quirrell was about to resume his dull narrative until the end of class, a hoarse voice echoed in his mind. Give me control of the body. Master, what are you planning to do? Give it to me. You mustn't act impulsively. This is Hogwarts. Dumbledore is always around. I know what I'm doing. Give me control of your body. Faced with Voldemort's irrefutable demand, Quirrell, who had been delivering a monotonous lecture, suddenly paused. He lowered his head and then raised it again, his demeanor noticeably altered. The students, including Blake, sensed a change. Professor Quirrell's temperament seems different. Blake's eyes sparkled with excitement. This was Voldemort in action. Quirrell, now under Voldemort's influence, dismissed the idea of continuing with the tedious stories. They're far too boring. If that's the case, let's proceed with a demonstration. With a wave of Quirrell's hand, the writing and pictures on the blackboard vanished, and the large podium moved to the side. Of course, he said, his voice carrying a new, ominous tone. Let's start the demonstration, Roland announced. When you encounter dark wizards outside, how will you face them? I'm going to invite a classmate up here so we can demonstrate. Quirrell concluded, his gaze settling on Blake. Blake sensed a hint of danger in those eyes, but internally scoffed at the thought. Danger? I doubt you, Tom, would dare to lay a finger on me in Dumbledore's hall. And even if you did, my wand might prove difficult to overcome. Feigning surprise, Blake eagerly raised his hand. Professor, let me volunteer. His enthusiasm seemed genuine, a perfect act of admiration for Quirrell. Quirrell's lips curled into a sinister smile. Then come up here. You're Blake Green, right? Yes, Professor Quirrell, Blake replied, rushing to the front. The students, initially drowsy, were now fully alert and intrigued. Blake's overt admiration for Quirrell and the promise of a live demonstration had captured their interest, far more engaging than the previous dull lecture. At this moment, nobody questioned Quirrell's sudden lack of a stutter. Take out your wand, child, Quirrell instructed, holding his own wand with a confident flair. Blake couldn't help but admire Quirrell's posture. So arrogant, yet so impressive, and you claim you're not, Tom? All right then, Blake responded, pulling out his custom wand, which he had disguised to resemble a mithril wand, making it appear more robust and formidable. Quirrell paused for a moment upon seeing Blake's wand, then proceeded, now let, us pretend you're a dark wizard preparing to attack me. Use your best spell against me, and I'll demonstrate how to counter it. Blake understood Quirrell's intention immediately. This was a setup to teach him a lesson under the guise of instruction. Though Quirrell might not dare to kill him, he was certainly looking to cause significant discomfort. Why is Tom resorting to such pettiness? Has he become more unhinged over time? Professor, I'm not familiar with attack spells. I haven't learned any yet. Blake feigned ignorance, causing Hermione to question his claim silently. How could Blake not know any attack spells when he had previously defeated a hidden monster? What was he planning? It's okay. I'll teach you one now. This will be a learning opportunity for everyone here. This spell is a basic defensive spell against dark magic. Quirrell said, proceeding to teach the spell to the class. Under Blake's influence, Harry Potter had become an adversary of Voldemort. After learning the spell, are you ready? Then, attack me. Quirrell stood calmly, waiting. Blake, cautious yet determined, prepared himself. If this was the game they were playing, fluorescent flicker, he cast, opting for an illumination spell instead of an attack. This choice was inspired by Gandalf's magic, ensuring a non-aggressive yet effective response. Blake's strategy was clear. He aimed to navigate the situation without escalating it into violence, all while under the watchful eyes of Quirrell, who was none other than Voldemort in disguise. This encounter was not just a demonstration, but a subtle battle of wits and wills. 
the illumination spell cast by Blake was unlike anything anyone had ever seen. While others could muster spells that might serve as a modest flashlight, Blake's spell erupted like a blinding flash bomb. Wow, my eyes! was the collective outcry as everyone instinctively shielded their eyes from the intense light. Quirrell, or rather the entity controlling him, was taken aback. The sheer power of Blake's spell was unexpected, and for a moment he was caught off guard, having anticipated a simple disarming charm. Instead, he was met with a dazzling burst of light, forcing him to hastily conjure an iron armor spell for protection. Given that Voldemort was operating through Quirrell's body with a fraction of his power, and now temporarily blinded, he had no choice but to lower his defensive shield. This left him vulnerable, unable to see and defend against any incoming spells from Blake. In an unexpected turn, Quirrell's body seized up, and then, just as suddenly, the real Quirrell found himself back in control, overwhelmed by a rush of shameful yet intense pleasure. Without Voldemort's dominion over him, Quirrell collapsed to the ground, incapacitated by the overwhelming sensation. Blake watched with a smirk as Quirrell writhed on the floor. He had employed a magical variant of the Love Horse Kill Chicken technique, a spell that could be triggered by any form of magic, including his blinding illumination spell. The key was the transmission of magical power. If an opponent preemptively shielded themselves with a spell like the Iron Armor spell, they could avoid the effects. However, Voldemort, having underestimated Blake and reacted too late with the protective spell, was caught off guard. This success was partly due to the absence of such an unconventional technique in the wizarding world, allowing Blake to exploit the element of surprise. The spell was designed to target and control a specific individual, sparing everyone else in the vicinity from its effects. As the classroom began to recover from the blinding light, Blake feigned concern, exclaiming, Oh no, Professor Quirrell's old illness has relapsed. Meanwhile, Quirrell lay on the ground, a victim of Blake's cunning and magical prowess, leaving those present in a state of shock and confusion over the sudden turn of events. Chapter 66, The Unforeseen Consequences of Blake's Spell In the principal's office, Dumbledore's tone was laced with uncertainty as he inquired, So you merely cast an illumination spell, and then Professor Quirrell relapsed? Blake met Dumbledore's gaze with unwavering confidence. Yes, Professor, you can trust me. The students who witnessed the event can vouch for me, he assured. Dumbledore nodded, accepting Blake's explanation. He pondered the possibility that Blake's spell might have inadvertently triggered Quirrell's collapse due to the lingering effects of Voldemort's possession. However, Dumbledore decided it wasn't the right time to confront Quirrell about this. Dumbledore was puzzled by the intensity of Blake's illumination spell, which had been far more powerful than expected, lighting up the entire classroom without causing any harm to the students. Eyes, a feat that seemed impossible under normal circumstances. Blake apologized, explaining his thought process during the incident with Quirrell. He had hoped to use the spell as a distraction, not anticipating the overwhelming power it would unleash. Dumbledore's expression grew serious as he considered the instability of Blake's magic, recalling a previous incident where Blake's wand had exploded. He resolved to consult Grindelwald, who had a vested interest in Blake, and might shed light on the boy's unusual magical abilities. Reassuring Blake, Dumbledore promised to investigate the matter further, advising him not to worry about the unintended consequences of his spell. Before Blake could leave, Dumbledore stopped him, expressing regret for a misunderstanding that had occurred earlier in the day, and offering Blake the chance to make a request as a form of apology. Surprised by Dumbledore's gesture, Blake hesitantly asked if he could bring his pet Briar to Hogwarts, only to be reminded that it was against the rules. However, Dumbledore suggested that Blake could perhaps find solace in spending time with Hagrid, a proposal that brightened Blake's spirits. As Blake left the headmaster's office, he felt a sense of accomplishment. Not only had he played a part in exposing Voldemort and Quirrell, but he had also been rewarded with valuable treasures and the possibility of continuing his experiments with druid magic, which promised to enhance both plants and animals. Originally, Briar was just an ordinary bear. However, when Blake was at home, 
he would use druid magic to enhance Briar's strength every day. His intention was to restore Briar's vitality, compensating for the physical toll taken by its time in the circus. Unexpectedly, Blake discovered something remarkable. Briar, once an ordinary bear, had begun to exhibit magical qualities, albeit weakly. This discovery led Blake to ponder a fascinating question. If he continued to strengthen Briar, could the bear evolve into a magical creature? And if so, could other magical creatures, under the influence of druid magic, experience a significant increase in their powers? Blake found this prospect exciting. Success in this experiment could mean that any magical creatures he tamed in the future would possess extraordinary strength, and some might even advance to higher levels of power. Meanwhile, in the Hogwarts dining hall, the students were abuzz with discussions about the morning's defense against the dark arts class. Blake's dramatic use of an illumination spell had exacerbated Professor Quirrell's chronic condition, a spectacle that had never been witnessed in Hogwarts' straying history. A professor had never before been bested by a first-year student in such a manner. At the Hufflepuff table, the first-year students were particularly engaged in this topic. They were puzzled by Blake's excessive praise for Professor Quirrell, given the professor's disorganized lecture. Roger, one of the students, explained Blake's true motive with a chuckle. He suggested that Blake's praise was a strategic move to make the class more engaging and ensure that they learn something practical, like the disarm spell. This revelette, Ion led to a newfound appreciation for Blake's actions among his peers. The conversation then shifted to Professor Quirrell's condition. The students speculated that his sudden vulnerability to Blake's spell was a result of lingering effects from an encounter in the Albanian forest, where he had been tortured by a vampire and an old witch. This theory was supported by Madame Pomfrey's observations. Curiosity about Quirrell's condition led to the discovery that he had removed his scarf, revealing a large, burn-like scar on the back of his head. In a different setting, Blake sat alone in front of a cabin, contemplating his next steps. He had just opened a treasure chest, revealing a reward that granted him top-grade potioneering talent. This new ability promised to further enhance his capabilities and influence his future experiments and adventures at Hogwarts. This series of events highlighted the intricate dynamics at play within Hogwarts, showcasing the curiosity, ingenuity, and camaraderie among the students, as well as the mysterious and sometimes perilous nature of the magical world they inhabited. Blake nodded in satisfaction, content in the knowledge that his talent in potion-making would spare him from the undue hardships the old bat, as the students referred to the professor, typically reserved for those outside Slytherin House. This was a piece of wisdom passed down from the upperclassmen to the freshmen. His gaze then shifted to the diamond treasure chest before him. After a moment's hesitation, he decided against opening it immediately. Lately, he had been opening treasure chests at a rapid pace, unlocking nearly all available skills and talents. The allure of the diamond treasure chest's rewards had diminished for him. Thus, Blake resolved to accumulate a collection of treasure chests first, aiming for the reward of the supreme treasure chest, which contained an ancient magic. He felt his arsenal of trump cards was lacking, and acquiring another supreme treasure chest seemed like a prudent goal. However, the odds of directly obtaining a supreme treasure chest were slim. Synthesizing one from seven diamond treasure chests appeared to be a more reliable strategy. Given his current rate of acquiring treasure chests, Blake was confident it wouldn't be long before he secured a supreme treasure chest. With this thought in mind, Blake stood and approached a devil's snare, which, despite its typically aggressive nature, became docile in his presence. He extended his palm, and green magic from the great druid flowed into the plant, causing its hue to deepen. Meanwhile, in his office, Professor Quarrel's screams pierced the silence, a testament to the torture inflicted by Voldemort, who had taken residence at the back of his head. Thanks to soundproof spells, these screams were confined to the office. Eventually, the screams gave way to Quarrel's soft sobs. That boy! Voldemort's voice emanated from the scar on the back of Quirrell's head, where his face had manifested. Yes, my master, I will ensure Harry Potter becomes a... Quirrell began. Not Potter, the boy named Blake Green, Voldemort corrected sharply. 
Yes, master. What about him? Quirrell inquired, his voice trembling. Are you so blind not to sense his unusual magic? Voldemort chastised. I, I did feel something, Quirrell admitted. It was a type of magic I've never encountered before. At his age, profound magic is beyond his reach. It must be an innate talent, Voldemort mused, his interest piqued. Did you not notice your condition improving after being struck by his magic? That strange illumination spell, and the peculiar magic accompanying it. I will investigate for you, Master, Quirrell offered eagerly. No, I shall look into it myself, Voldemort decided, causing Quirrell to shudder. Do you wish to retain control of your body? Voldemort inquired, sensing hesitation. No, Master, I dare not. I am wholly yours, Quirrell responded meekly. When is Blake's next defense against the Dark Arts class? Voldemort asked, Aller, Eddie formulating a plan. Master wishes to teach the class himself? Quirrell was taken aback. I'm only interested in him. As for your other classes, manage them as you see fit, Voldemort dismissed. He seems to hold you in high regard. Perhaps you can use that to our advantage. Chapter 67 Shocking Dumbledore's Superb Talent Grindelwald's Collection of Books The history of magic class lived up to its reputation for being uneventful. The only notable aspect was the professor, a ghost, who failed to capture the student's attention. Blake, having already familiarized himself with the history of magic textbooks, found no need to pay attention to Professor Cuthbert Bin's monotonous lecture, which seemed unchanged for centuries and seldom included any form of interaction or inquiry. The class was so dull that it seemed to cast a soporific spell over the students, leaving most of them nodding off into a dreamy slumber. Only Hermione's keen interest remained unaffected, diligently noting down dates while the rest of the class struggled to stay awake. Blake, however, chose to utilize his time differently. On his desk lay a piece of worn parchment, one of the items he had acquired from Filch's office. The parchment was covered in densely packed notes, but its true purpose and the locations it marked remained a mystery to Blake. Given its discovery at Hogwarts, Blake speculated it must be related to the school in some way. Upon closer inspection, he noticed an irregular curve in one corner of the map, possibly outlining a section of a lake. Could it be the Black Lake? He wondered. Having only been at Hogwarts for a short period, Blake was unfamiliar with the lake's shape, but theorized that if this was indeed the Black Lake, then the marked points could be located in the Forbidden Forest. As Professor Binns continued his lecture, oblivious to the disengaged class, Blake planned to investigate the map further after class. Meanwhile, Hermione's attempts to engage with the ghostly professor proved futile, leading Blake to dismiss any hope of gaining favor with Binns. Instead, he turned his attention to a book on alchemy authored by Dumbledore. With his talents in advanced alchemy, elementary alchemy proficiency, academic genius, and super memory, Blake's proficiency in alchemy grew rapidly. He meticulously studied the book, taking notes and observing a swift increase in his elementary alchemy experience. After exhausting his alchemy resources, Blake shifted his focus to potion studies. His background in herbology, coupled with his talent in potion studies, allowed him to learn at an even faster pace. Wayne and Roger, who had been asleep beside him, were eventually stirred awake by Blake's fervent studying. The class, initially a mundane affair, became a backdrop for Blake's relentless pursuit of knowledge, showcasing his exceptional talents and dedication. Unbeknownst to the drowsy students, Blake's discovery of the mysterious map and his academic endeavors hinted at adventures and challenges that lay ahead, far beyond the confines of the history of magic classroom. Surrounded by the sound of flipping pages, Wayne subconsciously touched the pocket of his school uniform, then began to rub his eyes. I must not be fully awake, he thought. Otherwise, why would I believe a pocket could hold so many books? As the long and tedious history of magic class finally concluded, Blake, having flipped through the books too quickly and finding no more to read, reluctantly joined his classmates in their slumber. Feeling refreshed upon waking, he had two objectives in mind. First, to confirm if the silhouette on the map was indeed Black Lake, and second, to request more books from Dumbledore, as he had exhausted his current collection. Blake carefully placed all the books back into the magically expanded pocket of his school uniform, then hurried out of the classroom. Hermione attempted to stop him, 
but he was too quick, vanishing around the corner and out of sight. Hey, Blake, the greenhouse for the herbology class is in the opposite direction. Hermione called out as she chased after him. However, after turning the corner, she found the long corridor empty. They left too quickly, she remarked in surprise, Toe, unaware that outside the window, a hawk was soaring toward the forbidden forest. Determined to verify the map's accuracy, Blake utilized his great druid ability to transform into a hawk, flying over the area where the forbidden forest met Black Lake. It didn't take long for him to find a landscape that matched the map's outline, confirming his suspicion that it was indeed Black Lake. This discovery meant that the marked places were within the Forbidden Forest, igniting Blake's curiosity. It's time to explore the Forbidden Forest, he thought. With his great druid abilities, venturing into the forest felt as natural as coming home. Upon Hermione's arrival at the greenhouse for herbology class, she was surprised to find Blake already there, engaging in a lively conversation with Professor Sprout. You went in the opposite direction. How did you get here before us? She asked, puzzled. It's very simple because I flew here, Blake replied honestly, though his truth was met with skepticism and an eye roll from Hermione. During the herbology class, Blake continued to vie for points alongside Hermione. Encouraged by Blake's enthusiasm, the other Hufflepuff students also participated actively. In the end, Hermione, despite her efforts, only managed to earn five points for Gryffindor prompting Professor Sprout to award her additional points out of sympathy. Later, when Blake visited Dumbledore's office, he arrived just in time to overhear Mr. Filch reporting a peculiar incident to the headmaster. After Mrs. Dolores noticed Blake, she exclaimed excitedly. Dumbledore asked Blake to wait a moment before addressing Filch. I'll look into this matter. You may go back now. Don't worry. After Filch and Mrs. Dolores left, Blake inquired about the situation. Dumbledore explained that someone had broken into Filch's office and stolen all the dangerous items collected over the years, suspecting the Weasley twins, though he doubted it was that simple. Blake, feeling somewhat guilty, yet confident he had left no trace, changed the subject. I've finished reading all these books, he said, pulling out a high pile of books from his pocket. So, I was hoping to ask you for a few more. Dumbledore looked at the pile in shock amazed by Blake's voracious reading appetite. Blake, it's only been two days since school started, and you've finished reading all these books? Dumbledore's tone was one of disbelief, a natural reaction considering the short amount of time Blake had had with the books. It would have been a daunting task for anyone to go through so many volumes in such a brief period, let alone comprehend them fully. But I'm telling the truth, Professor. I've had a good memory since I was young. Once I read something, I remember it, Blake insisted, his voice steady and confident. Dumbledore regarded Blake with a mix of surprise and skepticism. The idea of a student possessing a photographic memory to this extent was astonishing. If you're certain, then I shall test you, Dumbledore decided, his curiosity piqued. He was hopeful yet cautious, understanding the implications if Blake's claim held true, it would signify an extraordinary level of talent. Selecting a book on potionology from the pile, Dumbledore opened it to a random page. What's the formula for the invigorating potion? He asked, watching Blake closely. Blake's response was immediate and precise, reciting the formula down to the last detail, including punctuation. Dumbledore listened in amazement. It was clear that Blake didn't just memorize the content, he had internalized it completely. Dumbledore's initial surprise turned into excitement as he verified Blake's knowledge against several other books, each time finding Blake's recollections to be accurate. Blake, your talent is truly remarkable, Dumbledore finally said, setting aside the last book. However, I urge you not to become complacent, he continued. I will provide you with new books, but it's crucial that you fully understand and digest the knowledge you've acquired. Memorization alone is insufficient, especially in subjects like potionology and alchemy. Understanding the underlying principles is wover. Hat brings knowledge to life. Blake nodded in understanding. Professor, I assure you, I've not only memorized the information, but also comprehended it fully. That's why I came to you for new books. I'm ready for more. Dumbledore was taken aback by Blake's assertion. 
The boy's confidence and the evidence of his extraordinary memory made it hard to doubt his words. You're serious? Dumbledore asked, still trying to grasp the extent of Blake's abilities. You can test me further if you'd like, Blake offered, a confident smile on his face. After a few more tests, Dumbledore was left in awe. Blake's ability to memorize and master complex information with just a glance was beyond anything he had encountered. While magical means existed to enhance memory temporarily, Blake's natural talent was exceptional. Ding! Extremely shocked emotions detected, a voice announced in Blake's mind, followed by, Congratulations to the host for obtaining a diamond treasure chest. Blake's eyes sparkled with excitement as he looked at the newly acquired diamond treasure chest in his system space. His unique talent had not only impressed one of the most powerful wizards of the time, but also rewarded him in ways he had never imagined. Dumbledore gazed at Blake with a mixture of admiration and helplessness. Given the pace at which you're learning, I fear I'll soon run out of new material to offer you. But, Blake began, his eagerness palpable. Dumbledore interrupted with a twinkle in his eye. Fortunately, I have an old friend who possesses an extensive collection of valuable books. For my sake, I believe he would be willing to lend us his treasures for a while. A wave of excitement washed over Blake's face. He had a hunch about the identity of Dumbledore's mysterious friend, Nico Lemur. The name alone evoked awe, a legendary alchemist who had defied the ravages of time, living for centuries. When it came to the sheer volume of books, who else but Lemur could rival such a collection? With access to these books, Blake was confident he could continue to elevate his mastery across various subjects. Shortly thereafter, Blake left Dumbledore's office, his pockets magically expanded to carry dozens of the headmaster's books. To the average student, this collection would represent a year's worth of reading. Yet, for Blake, they were barely enough to occupy him for a single night. Dumbledore had mentioned needing a few days to arrange a meeting with Nico Lemur, but Blake was too impatient to wait. Upon returning to his dormitory, he pulled out a magical notebook and scribbled a message. I yearn for more knowledge, but I've already devoured Professor Dumbledore's entire collection. Within moments, a reply materialized on the page. What sort of collection could he possibly have? He penned all those books himself. Send your owl to me and I'll introduce you to the Grindle family's library. The response was laced with a hint of disdain for Dumbledore's collection, yet it sparked a flame of curiosity in Blake. The Grindelwald family was notorious, their name synonymous with dark chapters in wizarding history. Yet, the prospect of exploring their collection promised untold secrets and knowledge. With a sense of anticipation, Blake prepared to send his owl on a journey that would bridge the gap between him and the vast, unexplored archives of magical lore. Chapter 68, The Library in the Room of Requirement In the Room of Requirement, Blake was meticulously trimming a poisonous tentacle plant, carefully placing the severed leaves into a bag. The leaves of this plant were highly valuable, fetching ten gold coins each, a fact that underscored the absurd wealth hidden within Hogwarts' walls. Hogwarts, being one of the rare legal institutions allowed to cultivate such dangerous plants, benefited from the scarcity and consequent high value of these forbidden flora. Most wizards steered clear of the poisonous tentacles due to their danger and the strict regulations against their cultivation. Only someone as skilled as Blake, a formidable druid, could handle these plants without any protective measures, while others had to don protective gear to avoid their lethal bite. The plant was so perilous that it was rumored to have claimed the life of Professor McGonagall's husband. As Blake was engrossed in his task, the door to the Room of Requirement swung open and Cassandra entered, holding a box. She was taken aback by the sight of the fully grown poisonous tentacles, especially since they had only planted the seeds the day before. The rapid growth was astonishing, far beyond mere germination to what could only be described as full maturity. Blake, setting aside his scissors, explained with a hint of mystery that he had simply used a special kind of fertilizer though he chose to keep its nature a secret for the time being. His abilities as an archdruid allowed him to enhance the growth of plants far beyond what any ordinary fertilizer could achieve, without any adverse effects. Cassandra, though burning with curiosity, 
respected Blake's privacy and did not press further. She then presented Blake with the box, explaining it was delivered by his owl, which had been unable to find him directly. She expressed her astonishment at the size of the owl and its intelligence in seeking her out when it couldn't locate Blake. Blake, excited at the prospect of receiving the books promised by Grindelwald, eagerly took the suitcase from Cassandra. He anticipated a generous selection from the Grindelwald family's collection, far more than just a few books. Upon opening the suitcase, both he and Cassandra were surprised as it expanded to three times its original size with a couple of clicks. Cassandra, who had initially thought the suitcase contained merely a handful of books, was astounded by the transformation. Blake's casual mention of some books had drastically understated the reality of what lay within. The suitcase, now resembling a small library, revealed the depth of Grindelwald's generosity and the vast expanse of knowledge waiting to be explored. When Blake opened the small suitcase, Cassandra initially didn't expect much, assuming it could only hold a few books at best. However, her assumptions were quickly proven wrong. Instead of a simple stack of books, they were greeted by an entrance to an expansive space, revealed through a winding staircase that descended from the suitcase's opening to its depths. The suitcase, placed on the ground, transformed from a mere container into what appeared to be the entrance to a vast underground library. It was evident that the suitcase had been enchanted with an exceptionally powerful traceless stretching spell. Blake, with a flick of his wand, muttered, flickering fluorescent light, causing Cassandra to instinctively shield her eyes. What are you doing? Blake asked, puzzled by her reaction. Cassandra hesitantly explained, Well, I heard your illumination spell is quite intense. It can blind people. Blake paused, momentarily speechless, then shrugged off the need to explain the control he had over his spells, or the lack thereof, in this case. Leading the way, Blake stepped onto the magical escalator within the suitcase and his figure was swiftly enveloped by the enchantment. From inside, his voice echoed, inviting Cassandra to follow. Do you want to come in and take a look? Without hesitation, Cassandra's curiosity got the better of her, and she followed suit, her initial apprehension replaced by a smile. The escalator, much more comfortable than the straight-up ladder in Newt's case, hinted at the vast space that awaited them below. As they reached the bottom, the lights within the enchanted space automatically illuminated, revealing rows upon rows of bookshelves filled to the brim with books. Blake, extinguishing the illumination spell on his wand, gazed in awe at the sight before him. He had expected Grindelwald to send him books using the traceless stretch spell, but he hadn't anticipated receiving an entire mobile library. Cassandra, equally stunned, couldn't help but remark on the sheer volume of books. Are these the sum books you mentioned? She asked incredulously. This is more like a small library than sum books. Blake, accepting a silver treasure chest from Cassandra, explored the library further. Amidst the bookshelves, a desk and a comfortable armchair awaited, along with a note that read, This is a small part of our family's library. There's more after you finish reading this. Note, not a single Dumbledore book. Realizing the extent of the collection, Blake was astounded. These books are enough for me to read for a month, he mused, to which Cassandra rolled her eyes. The idea that such a vast collection could be consumed in merely a month seemed absurd to her. As Blake perused the library, he noted the thoughtful organization of the books into various categories, including magic spell books and potion-making volumes. The comprehensive collection covered every subject, promising a significant advancement in his magical education. Cassandra, curious about the origin of such an extensive collection, couldn't help but ask, So, where in the world did you get so many books? Blake's response was nonchalant as if the marvel of the library was just another aspect of his extraordinary world. Such a situation would certainly baffle anyone. A very special friend, Blake explained, his voice tinged with secrecy. He's asked me not to reveal his name to anyone. And please, could you keep this between us? As Cassandra listened to Blake, she found herself nodding in understanding. Everyone had their secrets, after all. Yet, the fact that Blake was willing to share even a fraction of his with her filled her with an inexplicable sense of joy. Not long afterward, Blake and Cassandra exited the private box. 
Blake, ever generous, had lent several spellbooks to Cassandra. However, unlike Blake, Cassandra found the dense and arcane nature of these books daunting. A single volume seemed like it would take her ages to study. Try to keep these books out of sight, Blake advised, aware of the potential consequences. The Grindelwald family might have owned a vast collection of books, but with Grindelwald's power having once swept across Europe, it was hard to distinguish which books were legitimately acquired and which were plundered. Despite Grindelwald's kindness to him, Blake couldn't ignore the man's dark past. Opting not to take the book box with him, Blake left it in the small wooden house within the Room of Requirement, believing it to be a safer and more discreet location than his dormitory. With his invisibility cloak, he could easily visit the room under the cover of night to read in peace. Moreover, he was keen on keeping his interactions with Grindelwald a secret from Dumbledore, given the latter's history and sensitivity regarding Grindelwald. After dinner, Blake received a note that appeared to be in Dumbledore's handwriting. The note instructed him to meet Hagrid, which immediately piqued Blake's interest. Dumbledore had indeed kept his promise and sent a bear to Hogwarts. However, in Hagrid's eyes, this ordinary brown bear was no more imposing than a slightly larger Siberian hamster, which reassured Dumbledore. Upon arriving at Hagrid's hut, Blake spotted the bear sitting obediently outside, with Hagrid feeding it a bucket of salmon. Look how thin you've become, Hagrid lamented, concern evident in her voice. Good evening, Hagrid, Blake greeted, earning a warm smile from the bearded giant. Ah, Blake, Hagrid responded, turning to face him. Your little pet arrived this afternoon, but I must say, whoever was taking care of it before didn't do a very good job. It's far too thin. Blake glanced at the bear, which weighed a hefty four to five hundred pounds, and couldn't help but disagree silently. To him, the bear seemed more than well-nourished. Yet, in Hagrid's perspective, it was indeed underweight. The bear, upon seeing Blake, displayed an endearing, albeit awkward, smile. Seems like you two have a strong bond, Hagrid observed, smiling. Don't worry, Blake. I'll make a comfortable nest for it in the Forbidden Forest and take good care of it. It'll be in better hands than ever before. Thank you, Hagrid, Blake expressed his gratitude with a smile, appreciating Hagrid's enthusiasm. Hagrid's fondness for animals, especially the more formidable ones, resonated with Blake, who had dreamt of raising a dragon since he was young. Their shared passion for creatures, fierce and gentle alike, forged a strong connection between them. After sharing a pleasant cup of tea, Blake and Hagrid set out to prepare a nest for the bear at the edge of the Forbidden Forest, near Hagrid's hut. While Hagrid was preoccupied, Blake seized the opportunity to use his druidic magic to enhance the nest, ensuring the bear's comfort and safety in its new home. Inside Big Bear's body, Blake was relieved to discover that the magic was still intact. This meant that Big Bear wouldn't revert to being an ordinary bear due to the druid's magic strengthening. The experiment seemed very promising indeed. After spending some time with Hagrid, discussing their experiences with magical creatures over tea, Blake bid him farewell. However, instead of returning to his dormitory or the room of everything to read, Blake had other plans. He took out a map, its marked points igniting his curiosity. He knew he wouldn't be able to rest until he uncovered the secrets of those locations. With the details of the map etched into his memory, Blake prepared for his adventure. Unlike his previous attempts to explore with the Weasley twins, which often ended with them being ousted by Hagrid, Blake faced no such concerns this time. He didn't even need to enter the Forbidden Forest. In a deserted corridor of the castle, where no portraits hung on the walls to observe him, Blake activated the invisibility feature of his cloak. Then, utilizing his druidic skills, he transformed into an owl capable of night vision. To his delight, he discovered that the cloak's invisibility function remained effective even in his owl form. With a sense of liberation, Blake flew out of the corridor window. The cool night air was invigorating as he soared away from the castle, its lights twinkling and becoming distant. Orienting himself, he headed towards the nearest marked point on the map. I hope what I find there won't disappoint me, Blake thought, filled with anticipation as he glided through the night, eager to uncover the mysteries that awaited him. Chapter 69, The Fantastic Beasts Habitat Map 
squirrel's mischief. Under the night sky, the forbidden forest was a dark, ominous mass, its atmosphere heavy with a gloomy aura. However, through Blake's eyes, the scene was crystal clear. Utilizing the archdruid's skill, he had transformed into an owl, granting him the night vision characteristic of the species. This ability made the perilous forbidden forest feel almost like home to him. With his swift flight and invisibility, Blake navigated the skies above the forest without fear of danger, soon reaching the vicinity of the first marked point on his map. The forbidden forest was dense, making it challenging to discern the ground from the sky. Realizing he needed a closer look, Blake descended, landing on a large tree branch before seamlessly transitioning into a snake form. After ensuring the tree harbored no threats, he slithered down to the forest floor, where he then morphed into an agile leopard cat. Thanks to the invisibility afforded by his cloak, Blake felt secure. Even if a dark creature did manage to detect him and attack, it was unlikely to penetrate the cloak's defenses. Thus, his expedition into the Forbidden Forest was less an adventure and more a leisurely stroll. Blake chose to land a short distance from the marked point, preferring to approach cautiously and observe any potential dangers from the periphery rather than blundering directly into them. As a leopard cat, he moved swiftly through the forest, drawing ever closer to his destination. Suddenly, he halted, noticing a flicker of fluorescence ahead. In the pitch-dark forest, any source of light was unusual. Stealthily, Blake approached, discovering the light's source behind a large tree, a unicorn, its magnificent white fur reflecting the moonlight in a soft glow. Relieved, Blake admired the unicorn, lamenting how Hagrid harvested their hair for cushions, a tragic waste of such majestic creatures. After a moment, he continued towards the marked point, only to find more fluorescent lights. Standing at the designated spot, Blake realized it was a habitat for unicorns, with dozens of the rare creatures, including golden-haired foals, resting there. Perched on a branch in his leopard cat form, Blake pondered. The marked spots on his map corresponded to the habitats of magical creatures within the Forbidden Forest. However, he questioned the map's usefulness, considering magical creatures could migrate, potentially rendering the map obsolete. Why, then, had the mapmaker gone to such lengths to document these habitats? After some thought, Blake decided to investigate the next marked point, hoping to uncover more about the map's purpose and the mysterious mapmaker's intentions. Blake's curiosity had been thoroughly ignited. The fatigue that had been nagging at him dissipated as he climbed to the top of a tree, transforming into an owl with silent grace. With swift wings, he made his way toward the nearest marked spot on the mysterious map he had discovered. His speed was remarkable, and it wasn't long before he arrived at his destination. Unlike before, Blake didn't bother with stealth due to the sparse trees in the area, which allowed him a clear view from above. To his disappointment, the forest below was empty. Could I have been mistaken? He pondered, questioning his earlier hypothesis that the map marked the habitats of magical creatures. Was the unicorn I encountered earlier merely a coincidence? Just as he hovered, contemplating his next move, a series of hissing sounds pierced the silence of the forest. Yet, the area appeared devoid of life. Then it struck him. Thestrals, he realized. Only those who have witnessed death can see Thestrals. Although Blake had never faced death directly, his heart raced with the possibility of confirming his theory. Flying low over the forest, he observed hoofprints materializing out of thin air, a clear indication of the invisible creature's presence. Emboldened by his discovery, Blake continued his exploration, visiting other marked locations on the map. His journey revealed a variety of magical creatures, hippogriffs, mooncalves, foopers, and even a secluded corner deep within the Forbidden Forest where he spotted a nest of basilisks. His most significant find was the habitat of the Acromantula, where he glimpsed the cave that housed Aragog from a distance. This discovery led Blake to surmise that the map was of recent origin, considering Aragog's introduction to the Forbidden Forest occurred only fifty years prior, during Hagrid's time at Hogwarts. However, Blake refrained from jumping to conclusions. He recalled the Marauder's map, which updated in real time to show the current location and names of individuals within Hogwarts. If this map possessed a similar enchantment, 
it would explain the mapmaker's confidence despite the potential migration of these magical creatures. The map could dynamically update to reflect the movements and new habitats of the creatures. With these thoughts in mind, Blake decided to return to the castle for a closer examination of the map. Transforming into an inconspicuous leopard cat, he navigated the corridors silently and made his way to the Hufflepuff common room. Ensuring the coast was clear, he reverted to his human form and entered the common room, where the late hour did not seem to deter the presence of his fellow Hufflepuffs. It was around midnight, and the common room was still lively, with several students milling about. Their lack of surprise at Blake's late return was attributed to the proximity of the school's kitchens to the Hufflepuff common room. Late-night snacks were a common indulgence, and Blake's appearance at this hour raised no eyebrows. A few upperclassmen even greeted him, their minds set on a nocturnal visit to the kitchens, a routine that had become a cherished part of Hufflepuff tradition. Blake slipped back into his dormitory unnoticed. Inside, his two roommates, Wayne and Roger, were still awake, engrossed in playing with Dabao. The trio had formed an unlikely friendship with the creature after an initial altercation, largely because Dabao, under Blake's firm instructions, had ceased its mischievous behavior and instead embraced a more amicable demeanor. Roger had even constructed a cozy nest for it. Opting not to interrupt their fun, Blake settled onto his bed and retrieved the map from his belongings. Having honed his skills in alchemy and magic, Blake revisited the map with a keen eye and discovered peculiarities he hadn't noticed before. A smile crept across his face as he wielded his wand, tapping the upper left corner of the map thrice. The map underwent a remarkable transformation. What was once a rudimentary sketch blossomed into a vivid, detailed landscape. Colors filled the spaces between lines, and the static markers representing magical creatures now outlined their forms in real time, moving ever so slightly. This dynamic feature indicated the creature's current locations, even if they migrated, making the map an invaluable tool for Blake. The Forbidden Forest's vastness had previously made searching for specific magical creatures a daunting task, but with this enhanced map, Blake could navigate directly to their habitats to collect the magical materials he needed for various purposes, including upgrading his cloak, crafting alchemy items, and synthesizing equipment. Wayne and Roger, having tired themselves out, approached Blake with sniff in tow. Sensing their arrival, Blake discreetly tapped his wand against the map, reverting it to its simpler form. How's Dabao been today? Any trouble? Blake inquired. Not at all. Dabao's been great. We're all good friends now, aren't we? They replied, to which Dabao responded with a series of squeaks, humorously insinuating its pivotal role in maintaining the harmony of their little group. Blake chuckled, rewarding Dabao with a gold coin, which the creature examined skeptically before happily pocketing it. In the days that followed, Blake's routine remained largely unchanged. He skipped classes, opting instead to spend his time in a magical room tea hat catered to his every need, where he tended to magical plants and delved into the books he had stored there. He also continued to explore the capabilities of the enchanted map and began planning a venture into the Forbidden Forest to gather materials from the magical creatures he could now easily locate. Additionally, Blake set his sights on creating a new map of the Resurrection Point, inspired by the Marauder's Map in the possession of the Weasley Twins. Confident in his abilities, he saw no reason he couldn't replicate their success. However, an unexpected change in the school's atmosphere caught Blake's attention. Professor Quirrell, who had previously exhibited a somewhat lackluster approach to teaching defense against the dark arts, had undergone a noticeable transformation. Suddenly, he was engaging students with a vigor that was entirely new. This shift in demeanor piqued Blake's curiosity, especially since the change seemed isolated to Quirrell's classes alone. In the defense against the dark arts class, everything had changed dramatically. The instructor was no longer the Quirrell that everyone was accustomed to, it was as if Voldemort himself had taken over, teaching the class directly. Blake was acutely aware of this transformation. He understood that this was precisely what Tom Riddle, also known as Voldemort, had intended, and it seemed that Blake was his primary target. However, 
What baffled Blake the most was the absence of any hostility from Voldemort. This was a stark contrast to their last encounter when Voldemort had attempted to incinerate him. Yet, here he was, teaching defense against the dark arts without causing Blake any harm. Blake was at a loss, unable to decipher Voldemort's motives. With no other options, Blake decided to seek advice from Dumbledore, knowing that the headmaster was already aware of the peculiar situation with Quirrell. Dumbledore also had knowledge of Blake's awareness of the issue. Upon reaching Dumbledore's office and sharing his observations about Quirrell's sudden and drastic change in teaching style, Dumbledore expressed his concern. I've heard about this as well, Dumbledore said, his brow furrowed in thought. Quirrell's approach to teaching has indeed undergone a significant transformation. Blake, feeling uncertain, shared his intuition with Dumbledore. I sensed a powerful aura emanating from Quirrell, akin to the aura I feel in your presence. I'm not sure how proficient Quirrell was before, but it's hard to believe he could match your strength, Blake explained. Dumbledore nodded, showing trust in Blake's instincts. It seems he has set his sights on you, Blake. Perhaps your use of the illumination spell previously revealed something to Tom. Dumbledore speculated. Concerned, Blake asked, Then what should I do? Continue as you have been, Blake. I've already arranged for someone trustworthy to keep a close watch on him, Dumbledore reassured him. Professor Snape? Blake guessed, somewhat surprised. Dumbledore looked at Blake with a mixture of astonishment and amusement. How did you know? He was glaring at Quirrell's scarf during dinner, Blake replied, a hint of frustration in his voice. Dumbledore was momentarily at a loss for words, reflecting on the complexity of the situation and the astuteness of his students. Chapter 70, The Magical Creatures and Plants Attribute Panel, launching the second generation training program. In the tranquil evening, at the outskirts of the Forbidden Forest, within the cave that Big Bear called home, Blake extended his right hand, pressing it gently against Big Bear's back. A soft green glow of druid magic flowed from his palm, seeping into the bear's body, fortifying it from within. Big Bear lay there, completely at ease reveling in the sensation of Blake's magical massage. After some time, Blake withdrew his hand, concluding today's enhancement session. He had reached the limit of magic that Big Bear could absorb for the day, a familiar threshold. Big Bear got up, visibly exhilarated, and communicated its delight to Blake with a series of joyful roars. It seemed to say, my back no longer aches, my legs feel strong, and I can enjoy a huge bucket of salmon without getting winded. Clearly, Blake's efforts were greatly appreciated. Blake affectionately patted Big Bear's head, sensing the growing magical energy within its body. He then inquired, Do you feel any changes besides the physical improvements? Big Bear responded enthusiastically, indicating it felt stronger and lighter than before. Although Blake could communicate with animals, understanding them fully was sometimes challenging due to their varying levels of intelligence. He wished he could precisely identify the enhancements Big Bear had experienced. If only there was a way to see their attributes at a glance, Blake mused, struck by a sudden thought. Perhaps there's a keyword for this? Recalling his experiences with the system, Blake tentatively voiced his thought. System. Pet attribute panel? Instantly, he heard the system's response. Triggered the pet panel keyword. Opening the pet panel, the system announced and a new virtual screen materialized before Blake. The interface was simple, listing his tamed pets, brown bear, big bear, an eagle owl, an eight-eyed giant spider, among others, and mentioning an unhatched magical animal egg. However, the information seemed basic. Drawing on his past interactions with the system, Blake tapped on brown bear, big bear on the virtual screen. The screen flickered and displayed a detailed attribute panel. Brown bear, big bear, available points, 90, Stamina, 20, Power, 25, Speed, 30, Endurance, 10, Attack, 21, Physical Defense, 20. Existing Skills, Slap, Brew Charge, Fatal Bite, Awaken Special Skill, Inactive, can be activated after Evolution. Evolution Mana Required for Next Evolution, 1900, 2000. Blake was thrilled. This detailed panel provided a clear overview of Big Bear's attributes and potential for growth. He noted the unassigned 90 points and the plus signs next to each attribute, realizing why the enhancements had seemed subtle to Big Bear. 
It wasn't just about feeling healthier. The attribute points hadn't been allocated yet. Reflecting on the past month of consistent strengthening, minus a few days, Blake calculated that each session added three attribute points to Big Bear. Additionally, the evolution required 2,000 points of magic power, and they were already at 1,800. This meant that with just four more days of strengthening, Big Bear could evolve from an ordinary brown bear into a magical creature. At that moment, it was clear that the Big Bear's special skill panel was ready to be officially activated. This would allow it to comprehend abilities unique to magical creatures. Furthermore, upon evolving into a magical animal, Big Bear's strength was likely to increase, potentially setting the stage for further evolution. However, this process would require four days to complete. Only after Big Bear had fully evolved could Blake check the attribute panel to see if there was a possibility for further evolution. Blake deduced that this pet panel must be a feature linked to the druid panel, given that he tamed animals using the druid abilities, and in this world, druids were unheard of. Snapping back to reality, Blake began contemplating how to allocate points to Big Bear. Given its species, strength, and physical resilience were Big Bear's natural advantages. Surprisingly, Big Bear's initial speed was 30 points, underscoring the adage about the surprising speed of bears and the futility of trying to outrun them. Its physical defense of 20 points was also expected, reflecting the bear's robust nature. However, its magic defense was a mere two points, a concerning figure in a world dominated by magic. After some thought, Blake decided to allocate the 90 skill points he had. Recognizing Big Bear's formidable physical attributes and attack power, he concluded that his immediate adversaries would likely be wizards. Thus, there was no immediate need to enhance strength or physical resilience. Instead, the focus should be on bolstering defense, particularly against magic, and improving endurance, which would likely influence Big Bear's stamina in battle. Consequently, Blake allocated 10 points to endurance, enhancing Big Bear's combat stamina, and directed the remaining 80 points to magic defense. Given that wizards primarily rely on spells for offense, enhancing magic defense was crucial. Against a wizard's curse, a high magic defense was essential, though Blake was aware of the grim possibility of facing the death curse used by dark wizards. Unless he could equip Big Bear with gear resistant to such curses, increasing magic defense was the best interim measure. Blake also considered the potential of crafting pet equipment through alchemy, especially if he could learn from Nico LeMay with Dumbledore's help. This would significantly advance his alchemical skills, offering an alternative means to create protective gear for Big Bear. With time on his side and the prospect of acquiring more treasure chests, Blake was optimistic about the future. After allocating the points, 10 to endurance and 80 to magic defense, Blake observed a noticeable change. The plus sign next to the specific attributes vanished, and a peculiar glow emanated from Big Bear's brown fur, signifying the successful enhancement. Big Bear seemed more vibrant, a natural consequence of the increased endurance. Blake smiled, satisfied with the improvements. This was just the beginning of their journey, and with each step, they were becoming better prepared for the challenges that lay ahead in the magical world. Blake discovered an intriguing feature within the system panel for his experimental pet, a brown bear he affectionately named Big Bear. The panel displayed various attributes such as stamina, strength, speed, endurance, physical defense, and magic defense, along with existing skills like slap, brutal charge, and fatal bite. A notable addition was the option to reset attribute points by spending evolution magic power, a revelation that excited Blake. This meant he could adjust Big Bear's attributes without permanent consequences, allowing for experimentation to optimize the bear's capabilities. Feeling a sense of responsibility towards Big Bear, Blake decided to treat him with his favorite salmon and two large jars of honey. He expressed his gratitude to Big Bear for participating in his experiments, even asking if the bear regretted its involvement. Big Bear's naive response, coupled with a request for a mate, brought a mix of emotions to Blake. After ensuring the well-being of Big Bear, Blake turned his attention to another experimental subject, an eight-eyed giant spider from the Forbidden Forest. Strengthening it, 
and observing the changes in its attribute panel confirmed Blake's hypotheses about the potential for magical animals to evolve. However, the spider's evolution required a significantly higher amount of evolution mana compared to Big Bear, highlighting the differences in potential between ordinary and magical animals. Blake's curiosity then led him to explore the possibility of plants having attribute panels, similar to animals. To his delight, he discovered that plants indeed had their own panels, albeit without special skills. This revelation opened up new avenues for experimentati, starting with a poisonous tentacle plant. By examining its attributes, Blake began to understand the potential for enhancing plants through the same methods applied to his animal subjects. This exploration into the attributes and potential for evolution of both animals and plants marked a significant advancement in Blake's experiments, blending his passion for magical creatures with his burgeoning skills in magic and druidic practices. Blake had a revelation to diversify the magical plants he cultivated, selecting those with the most promising initial attributes for further cultivation. His goal was to nurture them until they mutated at which point he would pick the specimen with the superior traits for continued cultivation. This process, he envisioned, would lay the foundation for breeding a second and possibly even a third generation of mutant magical plants, each generation surpassing the last in quality. This train of thought led Blake to consider the potential of magical animals. If plants could be enhanced through selective breeding, why not animals? The idea of finding a suitable mate for Xiong Da, his magical bear, suddenly seemed not just appealing but necessary. Blake committed all his plans and data to memory, opting not to document them. He was aware of the experimental nature of his work and the controversy it might stir among his peers and professors. To avoid any potential backlash, he decided to keep his project under wraps for the time being. After all, Blake had a unique advantage only he could see the attribute panel, which allowed him to assess and compare the attributes of magical plants and animals in a way no one else could. After spending a considerable amount of time in the room of everything, Blake returned to his dormitory, exhausted. He took a shower and immediately fell into a deep sleep, too tired even to peruse Grindelwald's collection of books. Given the finite nature of the druid's magic calendar and the considerable amount of magical power he had expended, he needed the rest. The next morning, Blake was roused from his sleep by his roommate's urgent calls. Blake, get up. We have transfiguration first thing this morning. We can't afford to be late again. Despite having slept soundly, Blake found it difficult to wake up. He glanced at his watch in surprise upon hearing his usually lethargic roommates. It's only 6.30. What's gotten into you two this morning? Why not catch a few more hours of sleep? Didn't you hear? We have flying class this afternoon! Roger exclaimed, barely containing his excitement. We've been looking forward to it so much that we couldn't sleep at all. Oh, Blake responded, unimpressed as he turned over, attempting to go back to sleep. To him, flying was nothing new or particularly exciting. He had expected their enthusiasm to be for something far more intriguing. 